Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Rodrigo Graciano, and I'll be your host during this NYA Java SIG event. Um, first of all, I want to ask you to use the chat. I'm going to be on the side here to ask questions. Uh, please do ask as many questions as you want. And during the presentation, we're going to be asking those questions to our speaker tonight. Uh, please uh, just try it now. Let us know where you're joining from. Uh, we would love to hear from you. And also, if you're first time joining uh, NY Java SIG, and how did you hear? How did you hear about us? Um, please uh, remember to follow us on social media. JavaSIG.com is our website. NY Java SIG on Twitter. Uh, we're very active on Twitter. So if you're used to Twitter, please go there, follow us. You'll be notified about all of our future events. You can interact with us. Uh, it's a great point. It's a, uh, to be in contact with the leadership of the group. Uh, also, if you don't have a Twitter, please create one. It's very useful, right? Uh, we would like also to thank our sponsor. So here we have JetBrains, uh, which give us uh, uh, some license that we can raffle on our events. Uh, we will be raffling three JetBrains license tonight. So stay with us until the end of the presentation. You can be a luck winner of a one-year subscription to any, any of the JetBrains products. And here we have Agile Learner from Venkats Ramunia. It's a great uh, uh, website, has a lot of content and courses for you to take. Um, so going to our presentation tonight, um, Clint Dovlook, he's a zero trust advocate and senior director of software engineer at NetFoundry. He has a lot of experience with development, and tonight he will be talking about the open source, uh, OpenZD projects, and we can see, we will see how we can use it to improve the security of our Java applications. So, without further ado, Clint, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, the stage is yours. All right. Well, thanks, Rodrigo. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, my name is Clint. Um, I am from Rochester, New York. Uh, I know this is the, you know, the New York Java SIG, but for anybody who doesn't know where Rochester is in New York, it's not just upstate. I call it Western New York. I know everything north of Central Park is upstate, but this is Western New York. I didn't grow up in New York, so that's why I don't, uh, I don't, I don't call myself part of upstate New York. Um, I work for a company that's called NetFoundry. NetFoundry sponsors this project, which is a free and open source project called OpenZD. You can go out to GitHub right now and check it out while I talk if you want. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about application embedded zero trust. So zero trust, we're going to learn what that word even means. You might have heard it. It's a, it's a big buzzword, but we'll address a little bit about what zero trust really means. Um, like Rodrigo said, I've been doing this for lots of years. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in the communication space. I was uh, in the, uh, the IoT space for a very long time and before that telecommunications. So lots of familiar with lots of networking stuff. Oh, this guy down here in the lower right-hand corner, that's Ziggy. So you'll see Ziggy pop up once in a while. He's our mascot. Um, I don't know if it's true. I just, I just know it's true. Every open source project absolutely has to have a mascot, and that's ours. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the current network security setup. What does it look like to consider yourself you know, relatively secure? We'll do that overview of zero trust. I'll talk about how adding a SDK into your application that provides the zero trust principles is going to give your application superpowers. And then we'll see some of the ones that we've already done here at the Foundry, and they're also open source. You can go and check those out too. So let's talk about the current state of the art, what we think about as good enough security. All right, so here I've got a little uh, diagram of a network. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, we're gonna pretend that's our corporate headquarters. Uh, maybe we'll have some cars that are, you know, IoT device enabled. Maybe we have some users on cell phones. 
We've got home networks with equipment like mine up in the, up in the top there. But for, for our discussion, we're going to focus on that little lower left-hand corner of the, of the map here. So what I've done is I've replaced all of the, uh, the, the, you know, the business, the home, with this idea of a castle and a wall in a moat, because that's usually what you think of when you think of uh, network security. You think about, hey, I, I'll just put all of my stuff safe behind some sort of strong defense. And then once you're, once you're behind those walls, once you're over that moat, then it's all gravy, right? This is totally safe. It's my safe network. No worries whatsoever. I'm good to go. I think uh, everybody probably understands that's really probably not a good idea, particularly in today's day and age. Um, so what do we do? Well, we've decided that, hey, you know, okay, everything on this network is probably susceptible. So we should be smart. We're going to use TLS and we'll do secure protocols everywhere. FTP will go away and we'll use SCP or SFTP. We won't use HTTP anymore. We'll use HTTPS and then everything is gravy. We've got our defense in depth. We're done. Of course, that's not true. We're not done yet. We just started. This was such a good idea that many years ago, a couple of uh, projects were started. One was by this uh, thing called the Electronic Frontier Foundation called HTTPS Everywhere. And if, if you remember, it was a, a plugin that you would go and you would download and install in your browser. And what it would do was it would detect if your traffic was destined to a website which had an HTTPS endpoint or not. And if you were silly enough, like me or anybody back in the day, and you typed in HTTP colon slash slash google.com, it would upgrade you automatically to the HTTPS version. That was really cool. So that was trying to get everybody to get on that security bandwagon, use those secure protocols everywhere. Then Let's Encrypt came around. Everybody was like, hey, this TLS stuff is awesome, but I, how do I make a certificate? I, I can't make a certificate. I'm not going to go buy one. I need one that's free. So this is a nonprofit CA, and their job is obviously to bring certificates to everybody, allow you to get your own certificate so that you can have that secure network. So that was really cool. But what happens when an attacker, like our little fella down in the left here, gets behind those walls, gets, gets over that moat? Well, he's going to be looking for uh, targets of opportunity, right? So he's going to start sending bad packets to places and looking to compromise targets that are in that network. That's called horizontal movement. And that's very bad when it comes to the security of your network. How did that happen? Well, uh, you know, we're using secure protocols. Isn't that good enough? Of course, it's not good enough because lots of people use basic passwords, which are easily guessable or there's some easy attack that's able to be automated that lets you get that password and compromise that machine. Zero day exploits, we'll talk about some of those later. So obviously secure protocols themselves really just aren't enough. In case you haven't realized this yet, this is precisely how a VPN works. So when you have a VPN, you basically have one entry point into this giant amalgamation of a network that is your VPN that gets you access into your corporate network. And then once you're on that network, you can do whatever you want, go wherever you want. Your horizontal movement is generally relatively unrestricted. If you have access, you can get there. So people said, hey, this is a bad idea. I can't have my entire network uh, available. So the initial reaction is always, let's make the network smaller. So we'll take Ziggy and we'll plop him down and we'll, we'll make him a, uh, a cop. He's going to check the traffic as it comes. And so now only people who are allowed to be able to talk to the network, they're gonna be able to talk to the network. So now when that attacker starts to send those bad packets over to that target laptop, problem solved. We're, we, all right, we're gonna declare victory again, go home. But of course, that's not what happens. What happens is there's always a developer. There's always a DevOps person. There's always somebody QA maybe who needs to be able to access both of those networks, this dark blue network and this light blue network. And so that, that attacker, they're going to be resolute. They're going to stand tall. They're going to find that laptop and they're going to compromise it. And once they've compromised that laptop, then they'll just continue on their path. And now that seems silly, but that's exactly what happens all the time. All right. So what can we do to prevent, you know, these kinds of attacks? And this is where We'll start talking about some of the principles of zero trust. So I'm going to go back and replace the walls in the moat. We're going to get rid of that old motif. We're going to come back to our regular network and we'll take a look at what we can do next. 
So this is the first pillar of zero trust. Oh, I should also stand uh, zero trust, what it really means. Zero trust is a, a, a word that you'll hear. You can't throw a rock into the internet and not turn over some product that's going to claim that it's zero trust, right? So what zero trust means, which is really important, is that it's about not trusting your network. It's not about having no trust whatsoever. It's about not trusting your network. So the very first pillar of that is this idea of device identity. So what if our network was smart enough to realize that you're not even allowed to send packets on that network if you don't present some kind of strong identity? And by strong identity, in, in lots of cases, we mean some sort of certificate, some sort of cryptographically secure uh, entity. In our case, it'll be an X509 certificate. But now we're gonna say, hey, this network is smart enough to know who you are and whether or not you're even able to be on the network. And that process that you go through is called bootstrapping trust. And bootstrapping trust is difficult. We've got a really great uh, whole entire blog series that you can you can read down here, which is, uh, that's number five from the series, but um, it's a whole series about how the OpenZD project goes about bootstrapping the trust. At the end of the day, realistically, it comes down to a certificate signing request that's being sent from your machine to the controller that you have to establish that trust with. And you can go through this whole big long um, flow chart if you want, and we can talk about it later too. Uh, but this is how we bootstrap our trust. So here we have that attacker. He's decided that I, I can get behind the walls. I'm, I've plugged into my ethernet cable or I've gotten on the Wi-Fi or however it is, they're gonna start sending those bad packets over. But because we have device identity on our network, our network knows this, this attacker has no capability of sending packets on the network. The network basically doesn't even allow them to send packets. We frustrated the attacker yet again. And we once again can declare victory and go home, but of course we're not done yet. So what's, that, what's going to happen? Our attacker is going to start sprinkling USB sticks around or they'll somehow compromise of, you know, some sort of spear phishing campaign. They'll get access to that SA's laptop, that QA engineer, the developer, uh, and, and they'll compromise that machine. Once that machine's compromised, well, this machine has the ability of sending packets to that network. So just having that strong device identity is not enough. So we, what we have to do now is we have to figure out how can we possibly foil this? We, we have... We've, we've got these firewalls in front of all these computers, that, this idea of a firewall, the, the secure connectivity, this device identity. How are we going to deal with this? Well, this is where the next privilege or next idea comes in of least privilege. So what if this network not only could identify the, um, the strong identity that's trying to send these packets, but what happens if this network is also capable of determining who is allowed to send packets to whom, right? So here we have our attacker again. They've compromised that laptop, but our network doesn't permit this attacker to send packets to that actual laptop. The, la the network itself has kept us safe. We, we're, we're good again. We've gotten even one more layer of defense and uh, you know, we're doing a great job. Well, what happens though, if that attacker actually finds a laptop that's supposed to be able to communicate to that device? Well, then of course we're going to be defeated again. So no, uh, no security mechanism is foolproof. You know, we all know defense in depth. I've probably said it ten times already, but you'll hear it over and over. Um, really, one of our uh, sales guys has a great line where he talks about uh, the the whole idea of OpenZD is about making a, attacking your network so undesirable that nobody even wants to think about it. Because uh, there's a great joke where you know two two joggers are running in the woods. And a bear shows up. Oh, my goodness. What, what are we going to do? Hey, Frank, there's a bear. And, uh, and Frank looks at me and I look at Frank. And he's like, well, we can't outrun it. And I was like, Frank, I don't have to unrun the bear. I just have to outrun you, right? Same is true for security on your network. If you can be so difficult to attack that nobody has, wants to invest the time and the money into attacking you, that's one more, even one more layer of defense. Okay, so that's all a backstory about what zero trust is, uh, what network security is all about. So let's talk about application embedded zero trust. We need that foundation before we can talk about application embedded zero trust. You'll hear the term an overlay network. All right, so what is an overlay network? We're going to start with the internet. All right, we, uh, I, I make the uh, supposition that the internet is your network. So 
with the internet out there, we're going to turn that and we're going to call it our ZD overlay network. Open ZD, ZD, you'll hear us shorten Open ZD to ZD a lot. Um, an, an overlay network consists of a few pieces. The first piece is that controller. This is the real root of your trust. This is where your PKI is going to be stored. It's where the initial bootstrapping of trust has to come from. It is a critical piece of an overlay network. The next piece of that overlay network are these things called edge routers. Edge router's job in life, excuse me, is to take packets from devices and shuffle them across this thing we call a fabric. So we have this fabric, we have these edge routers, we have these routers in between here, and we have this other edge router. And so the OpenZD network actually forms a mesh network. Each of these, uh, each of these routers, if they're configured to, to um, form a link, will actually form a link to all the other routers, forming a full mesh. And that's pretty cool because the mesh network will allow you to get your packets from one router to the other router the fastest. Uh, we had a fellow who used to work here that used the term internet weather. I had never heard the term internet weather, but it's a great term because you would think from edge router to edge router, straight line, that's the fastest way to go. But sometimes that, that path is just bogged down and it's faster to go through two places or three places to get to that end destination. And the overlay network will take care of routing your packets from one place to the next. Um, each of those links that gets formed is has a little lock icon. So that means they're safe and secure. They're mutual TLS, which means the router itself will present a certificate to another router. The router will verify the certificate that's being presented is valid for the PKI that you formulated the network on. And the router that's attached to the server will do the same thing. So you have to ensure both sides are not only presenting, are both sides need to present valid certificates for a link to be formed. Then of course, uh, I'm gonna simplify the diagram because it gets really busy with all those mesh links in there and all the little lock icons. But um, then of course, the, the next piece of the puzzle is actually taking an SDK or an application and putting it on to a computer or into your API itself. And so what will happen is you'll send packets now over this overlay network to the destination. And if you hang out long enough, we're gonna see that in action uh, at the end of the presentation where we have some hands-on stuff. Oh, well, I didn't click my button. You gotta see the packets flow. All right, so this is a little overview of the next three slides I'm gonna show you. Basically, the idea is how much trust you are putting in your network. So the very first level uh, of zero trust network, and you'll see this is what most, most vendors will claim is their total zero trust solution, is you'll have a router that listens on your local network and you'll have a router on the far network and you'll consider everything in between as, as no trusty, right? Super secure, no trust. Um, but if you take a look at what's outside of that, you've got this local network, you've got your server's host, you've got the server's host network, the application on the server, and the same sort of thing on the client side. So there is a fair amount of trust in this no trust solution. The next thing you can do is you can take and you can widen that trust quite a bit. You can take and add a little agent on these machines, one on the server side, one on the room on the client side. And now your trust zone is quite a bit smaller, right? Now you're only really trusting this device host and this server host. And um, it, you have uh, a, a greatly reduced how much trust you have to have and how horizontally mobile, say, an attacker might be. Hey, Clint, we've got oh, yeah. a question. Sure. Um, isn't this the concept of Kubernetes service mesh? What's the difference? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it's a big question. Um, it is very similar to a Kubernetes service mesh. Generally speaking, I would say when I get this question, my, my number one answer is uh, with a service mesh, you're going to have ports somewhere that are open. Um, I don't know of one yet, which has no listening ports on some machine somewhere. There's always some sort of port which people send traffic into and that's, that is a not uh, a dark solution. But we'll get more into um, ports and listening at the end, but it's, it, there's a lot of similarities um, in an API gateway and a service mesh. Um, those are the two big ones I think of that can come up off, off the top of my head. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Um, and so there's one more step that we can go. We can take that uh, zero trust zone and extend it all the way into our apps. And so here we're basically not even trusting the host operating systems network because we take that zero trust, those the ideas of uh, device identity, the idea of least privilege, and we actually bake it directly into the application itself. 
All right, so for the next remainder, we're gonna focus on just our attacker and just that laptop, which that attacker has been attacking. So what are we trying to do with application embedded zero trust? What we're trying to do is we're trying to take our applications that we're all building, add some SDK into it, and then smush them together and magically create a secure application. That's the, that's the goal. And so then once we have our secure applications, we can deliver those secure applications to our, our users. And if that user's laptop becomes compromised, we hopefully are in a good situation where we, our application, our, our application can't be compromised. And that's the entire idea. So what if we had a version of SCP of SQL? I know it's not an application. I should redo this, but you get the idea. Uh, NFTP is also a protocol, right? We have, we have uh, applications which are sending over the SCP, the FTP and the SQL protocol. Well, let's say SCP tries to send packets to the SCP server on the other side. Those packets are destined for SCP. Those are fine. S SQL SQL sends packets to SQL. Those are fine. And S FTP sends packets to FTP. Those are fine. But let's say this compromised laptop, that user, that, that um, attacker tries to send packets to the FTP application using a SCP application or you know, one of their own tools. A, the, the idea is it's an application that's not this purpose-built app that has the security built into it that knows how to send traffic to SCP. Well, because that firewall, that little device identity, that least privilege is all baked into the application itself, that app has no idea how to even contact the FTP server. It doesn't know where the FTP server even is. Uh, the same is true for the SQL server. If you try to send SQL server traffic or FTP traffic from SQL server, it won't know how to do that. And same, of course, is true for SCP. So this is where the OpenZD project comes in. Um, OpenZD gives your applications superpowers. And we're gonna take a look at some of those superpowers here. If you're not familiar, the car on the top is a limousine. And it's the limousine that the United States president drives around in. It's called The Beast. On the bottom is a car that looks like something out of a movie from Mad Max. It's got armor built, it, you know, bolted on top of it. Uh, you can see where all the armor is. It probably doesn't drive very well, right? It's not, the security has been an afterthought on the bottom, whereas the security in The Beast is, is before thought. There is it, even though it's a, 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 you know, a tried and true trope, there is a lot of truth in security through obscurity. If you can't see the security, then that's one more layer of protection that you can offer. offer. And if you have that security baked into your application, well, then you've got one more piece of security to offer. So that, that limo on the top is bulletproof. It has tires that can't be slashed, right? You, you don't really know where all the security is. You don't know where the weak spots are. The Mad Max vehicle, you can clearly see where the armor is, where the armor is not. Um, another uh, side benefit of a zero trust overlay network with OpenZD is, is addressability. Um, I don't know how many people have tried to gain information based on an IP address, but lots of times when traffic enters your endpoint as an application developer, you might be behind a firewall, you might be behind a load balancer, you might have users who are in a corporate environment where all of their traffic is synthesized into one IP address. So before OpenZD, when you send traffic, you're limited to the idea of who the from address is. It's going to be an IP address. If you're really lucky and you own the app on both sides, you can add headers. Maybe you can get some information, but before you've even done all that, you'll have no information to go on ahead of time before you've uh, you know, started that uh, authorization process in your own application. You also have to use DNS, right? The, the, I love the haiku. Uh, it, it, it can't be DNS. No, what is it? Uh, it's, not, it's not DNS. It can't be DNS. It was DNS, right? Like uh, I, love, I love that joke because it's so true. But uh, DNS is difficult for lots of developers just because you got to go and deal with, you know, registering your domain somewhere. And if you don't have a Route 53 um, in Amazon to go and use, then finding your own domain. And it's, it's just it's just more mud in your wheels of getting your application out there. And of course that DNS name resolves to some kind of IP address. With a zero trust overlay network from OpenZD, you can, you, you can know absolutely who the person is who's starting this connection because of that strong identity. When you dial a service on the other side, you can tell that service that, you know, Clint is dialing say in this case, Jenkins, and you know absolutely where you're going to. Also, 
since it's an overlay network and there's no DNS necessarily involved, you don't have to bother with DNS. You can call this, you know, sandbox Jenkins, or you can call it Jenkins one, Jenkins two, it doesn't matter. It literally is up to you. The namespace, uh, you know, of opportunities for you to address is up to you. It's your network. You can call it whatever you want to call it. So that's really cool. Um, all too often, we think about zero trust as being at the edges, right? Like, this is only for my clients connecting to my server, but zero trust is for your server too. This is what I was hinting at before. Um, when you embed an SDK that provides a zero trust overlay into your application itself, your application does not need to listen on any ports. That's really cool because now you don't have to worry about people finding your app. They, they literally can't find your app. There is no open ports. All of your firewalls are always closed. There are no UDP hole punches allowed. There's no shenanigans, totally closed. All of your traffic is initiated from your machine out the firewall into the internet. So you have to have an outbound connection. You can't shut down, <laughs> gotta have some sort of network, but uh, no inbound connections whatsoever. Uh, totally dark is a huge, huge benefit of an overlay zero trust network provided by OpenZD. Uh, why is that relevant? Well, we're a bunch of Java users here. There was this thing that you might have heard about. Uh, it was powered by Log4j. And so here we have a Log4j server that's maybe a login page. And maybe that login page is logging what username is trying to log in. I know I've probably written this, <laughs> this login page. Um, and why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because, you know, we've got some port listening on some internet that comes right through that firewall. So now if I've got some attacker who wants to come and attack my uh, app that I've written with Log4j and done something as silly as what I just said, logged the username trying to log in, which seems totally reasonable. All of a sudden, you know, now they can start compromising systems that they might not, they're, they're not supposed to have access to. Contrast that to the OpenZD network. There is no open port. There is no way for that nefarious user to send a bad message to that log4j server. Now, those who are astute will notice if I were so brazen as to have uh, one of these users send the request in, absolutely could totally compromise the same log4j stuff, no problem. Uh, ZD cannot prevent that. ZD is not a, a web application firewall in that sort of way. Um, but the amount of users whom you are trusting has been dramatically reduced. It's not just some random person on the internet. It is only your users. And you could always find out exactly who accessed that service at what time through the, you know, logging metrics and whatnot. So you could totally find out who that might be. Oh, and then, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. Oh, now there's Spring. Spring's entering the picture too. So uh, Spring for Shell, that's another great one too. Um, we're going to actually look at some Spring Boot stuff at the end of this. Oh, by the way, the Spring Boot 9.8. If you haven't yet, you totally should go check out and update your version of Spring because a nine. Oh, this is a CVSS score. If you're not familiar with CVSS, um, I personally really, really like them. Uh, they're really useful and uh, it, it lets you gauge, you know, out of a 10, how, how big of a deal is this uh, this particular problem. So a CVSS of a 9.8 is like a, it's, it's, it is a absolute gold mine for people who are out there trying to be nefarious. Um, if we're or, gonna talk about spring, can we talk about how many people on this call are on Java nine or higher? Sure. I don't want to take away here to be everyone's vulnerable. And I know banks oh. tend to be a little slower on the curve. Oh, sure. well, that that's another, that's another great point is, uh, you know, what version of Java you're running. Um, the, the next thing, we can talk about that at the end, because uh, I think that'll be a ball of wax. Uh, the next thing that uh, in my deck here is about uh, server to client addressability. So in the IoT space, one of the things I have to do all the time is uh, some sort of HTTP long pull or a web socket or, you know, come up with some sort of really interesting idea or just straight up polling in order for my clients to be able to connect back to the server again to get some information that they need. With an OpenZD network, you can simply dial straight from the server right to whatever client. So if you wanted to send them an update, you got basically push notifications built in. Um, I have a couple of questions from the audience that I missed sure. while I was hassling you about Spring. 
Yeah. Um, the first one is how to proceed for improving the security of a network, like a domestic or office, and how do you monitor the in out flux traffic? Okay, so those are good questions. Um, the the I, th I think as I go through the deck, there'll be another section where uh, you'll hear me talk about the journey, and we can talk about that. You know, how do you secure a regular network at at that point? Because right now it's all application embedded. And the other two questions were follow-ups on that one, so I'll okay. hold them off. Yeah, let's hold them. Let's hold them to the to the end because I think that those are those are really good questions and uh, totally reasonable. Let me get through the application embedded stuff, and then we can get into that. Um, so Libsodium is the library which uh, the CSDK uses to provide end-to-end -to -end encryption. So when you use an open ZDSDK, you get end-to-end -end encryption for free, quote unquote for free, you gotta use the SDK, but uh, it, it comes by default. You have to go out of your way to turn off end-to-end -end encryption. So right there, let's say you be and all your traffic lands on your local interface and sends out, you, you will, you will well, in fact, if you write your FTP application yourself, you will have no unencrypted traffic on your local network, on your host network, or all the way over to the FTP server. Um, that end-to-end -end encryption is free. You also get link encryption as well. So if somebody compromises those nodes in the middle, those that mesh network, you don't have to worry about that either. Uh, and this is powered by ChaCha20, Poly 1305, which is a really cool algorithm that is kind of built for smaller devices. So it's also perfectly reasonable for IoT devices, which are oftentimes low powered. Port inference. This is another great one. Uh, I just went out and found some place at top 20 scanned ports. And these are the top 20 ports that get scanned. Uh, out, of, out of these, one of which is one that we've all seen before, 443. Everybody uses, four, like the, I, I imagine almost all your traffic is 443. Well, with an open ZD network, literally all your traffic is port 443. Because what open ZD does is it takes all of those protocols and maps them across a synthetic connection that is well, prop, well, and if you're like us, it's on port 443, but you can put it on 8080 if you want to put it on, it doesn't matter what port it is, right? The idea is it's single port. And if you put it on port 443, then all of your traffic looks like it's going over port 443. So it's impossible to just put a sniffer on and see, you know, who's sending SSH to who's, you know, wherever. It's just, it's totally impossible. It'll all look like 443. Uh, this is also incredibly easy. So here is the before and the after ZD. I'm going to make this really easy for you because I talked about this a little bit before, but before ZD, if you want to listen on some port, you'll have to know what IP address or what interface you want to bind on, and you'll have to know what port that you want to bind on as well. Well, with an open ZD solution, all you need to know is what the name is of your service. And then the identity, that strong identity, has to be able to bind the service because there's policies behind all of this stuff that says, hey, you know, that's, that server actually is allowed to bind this particular service. Uh, and then all the rest of your code looks almost exactly the same. I can go back if you want to see what it looks like, but look very, very similar. We can look at that some later too. Um, yeah, I'm going to just go through these relatively quickly because these are our existing ZDifications. You can go out to GitHub. Uh, everything, this is Ziggy again. He's a piece of ZD in case that's not obvious. Uh, so he's pasta. And because he's pasta, everything, we've heard every single baked ZD joke that you could hear of. And we have an open ZD test kitchen to fit in that vibe. Uh, so we've done things, uh, lots of go out on um, open ZD. You know, we, that's what a lot of the stuff is written in. So you'll see things like the SSH client that we have, which is cool because, you know, generally with SSH, you're going to have port 22 open. You know, even if you're using a bastion, you're going to have a bastion with port 22 open. Well, with OpenZD and with ZSSH, you don't need any bastions open because all your traffic is outbound through that firewall. Um, and then SCP, we have ZSCP, same, same idea as SCP, lets you transfer files. And just here's a, a kind of an idea of what it looks like when you use it. The, the reason I put this slide up is because of this up here, which is really neat. This is another feature of OpenZD that we call an addressable terminator. So this ZSSH server, that is the name of the identity which has binded, bound, the, the SSH service effectively. So I could pick up and move that identity if I wanted to, to another machine and still dial ZSSH server. Well, that's really neat because I, I don't need to have a bunch of services, one for every device, which I want to SSH into. I can just say every SSH server is able to bind the SSH service 
And now anybody who wants to ZSSH to that identity can. And the same is true for SCP. If you wanted to SCP files from the ZSCP you know, server, then you could do that as well. Service is just SVC. Mattermost is our chat app. So uh, it's a Slack kind of clone and we have Zetified it. You can't use chat in our company unless you're on an overlay network. When you push to GitHub or GitLab, you probably want to have your chat app like Mattermost notified. So we have these webhooks, which are Zetified. You can just add in the identity and they will actually reach it and, and hit your webhook for you. Um, and then shows up like this in my Mattermost chat. You know, So, hey, you've got these messages. Um, this one's really neat. This is a generified JDBC wrapper. We call it ZDBC. I could update these slides. Oof, there's already a demo. Um, but um, this one's really neat because we came up with a really interesting way of providing the zero trust connection where we don't need to maintain the driver that actually creates the, the you know, the or translates the actual bytes that go over the wire into payload. So we have a, a JDBC driver that you that kind of sits beside, say, Postgres. I'm going to show a Postgres demo afterwards, um, and it knows how to poke the the actual Postgres the actual Postgres driver correctly in such a way as to create a secure zero trust connection from either your application if you can't. Uh, write the code yourself. Like if you're in a BI world, we have a sales engineer who did this in like uh, Oracle's BI tool. I can't remember the name of it. Um, or if you were in say data grip, which is the demo I'll show later data, data grip. Oh, Hey, let's go call back to those sponsors, right? You've got to get a data grip subscription. If you, if you win, uh, it's a SQL server client written uh, by JetBrains. Uh, we have kubectl. Oh, oh, hey, there's a screenshot of data grip. You can see up here I've declared ZD Oracle. I've got a driver that I've named ZD Oracle, and then I have a special JDBC path down here. It's a little, I got to update that screenshot too, but you'll get the gist. <clears throat> oh, it's not just for Oracle. This is Postgres. Uh, there's kubectl. So if you've used Kubernetes, we've heard a little bit about Kubernetes. One of the attack planes of Kubernetes is the API, uh, depending on what cloud vendor you use. Um, like I use Oracle's cloud vendor for a Kubernetes cluster, and they give you the option of standing up an SSH bastion to access your Kubernetes cluster. That's pretty cool. Um, I just install ZD because if I install ZD inside of my cluster, I can then take my API totally private uh, and it still is available. And I can't say it's dark because the Kubernetes API is the one doing the listening, but it's entirely off the internet and is accessible only through my overlay network, which is really neat. Um, this is what that might look like. So if I have my Kubernetes API totally hidden, I have a pod that you can deploy through a Helm chart that provides you that it's it's kind of like ingress, but it's it's not an ingress server because there are no listening, like there's no listening ports here, right? Like this is all outbound into that public edge router. Um, and then you can either use unmodified kubectl and a tunneling app, which is what I'll get to in a second. Or you can use that application embedded zero trust thing called cube ZTL. All we do here is we change a C or an S and we put a Z there and then it's Z defined, right? So cube CETL becomes cube ZTL. Uh, so you'll see lots of Zs. I'm, you probably already picked up on that. Helm Z, Prometheus, right? Uh, Helm Z is kind of like a easier way to install things into Kubernetes. It makes it, um, I think it's a lot easier to use. So. Uh, you need to have access to the Helm. Uh, Helm needs access to the Kubernetes API. So you need a Helms in order to use that secure Kubernetes API. And the same is true for Prometheus, which is a monitoring tool, very popular now. But one of the neat things about Prometheus that makes it fit so well with ZD is that it is uh, it, it prefers to do a scrape as opposed to a push, which means uh, Prometheus wants to reach out into your workload and return some uh, some metrics that that you've prepared for it. Uh, you can push to. I know there's a push gateway, but they, their preferred method is to scrape. Uh, so with the zero trust enabled Prometheus, you can actually make it so that your Prometheus instance is totally dark, and the things that Prometheus scrapes are also totally dark, which is pretty cool. All right, here's that slide. This is the slide that I was talking about. It represents the longest path you can walk across the globe. And I like to show this slide because zero trust is absolutely a long slog. You're not going to go from zero to a hundred. You're going to say, 
maybe you'll ask a great question like, hey, this is all great, but how do I secure my actual network right now? Um, which is why we have these things that we call tunneling applications. Tunneling applications are SDK applications. They are built with our SDKs, but they are purpose-built for one job and one job only. And that job is to provide zero trust access to something. So here's a good example. This is my ZD desktop edge for Windows. We'll see that again later. But this is like a little agent that runs on your local machine and provides you that host access, the zero trust host access I talked about earlier. Not the, not the first tier of zero trust. It's that second tier of zero trust that's pretty darn good. Uh, so that's what these tunneling apps are for. We have them for all the major operating systems, Linux, um, Mac, Windows, the mobile OSs, et cetera. One of the most amazing superpowers of a uh, tunneling application of one of these, like the ZD desktop edge for Windows, is private DNS. Not only private DNS, but also authenticated DNS. So I can just make up any name of any service that I want to call it. If I want to call it Bodie McBoatface, I can. If I want to call it, you know, google.com, I can. In fact, what we'll see here in a minute is I've called one postgres.aws.zetified. Zetified is not a top level domain. They do not exist. And yet we will intercept that traffic and see how it works. Um, so that's really neat. And also really neat that authorization part that I talked about. If you turn off my, uh, inter my, not my interface, my identity, then I lose access to all of these uh, DNS entries, which only exist on my local DNS server. So if you're one of these persons who doesn't want to send traffic to Cloudflare, who doesn't want to send traffic to your ISP that says, hey, this guy's doing a DNS request to Bodie McBoatface, right? Um, if you have a, a tunneling application, None of that traffic ever leaves your machine. And then the only traffic that leaves is over port 443. So nobody's ever going to know. And it's going to go to some, some machine in the cloud that's just some random, you know, Amazon machine or Google machine or, you know, droplet or whatever. Uh, the journey continues, blah, blah, blah. It's the same stuff. You know, you can mix and match all this kind of stuff. It's cool. This is uh, really important. And uh, maybe you've seen this particular memo, but in case you haven't noticed, I've, I've kind of highlighted it up here, but I'll make it bigger for you. In this particular memo, the White House is talking about zero trust staggering 11 times. Like the, the United States government is starting to take this whole idea of no trust, of not trusting your network really, really seriously. Um, and they have some, you know, really good docs out there. Like some of it's really thick to get through, but this is a nice doc, uh, nice image that I stole out that I liked because it talks about some of the things that we talked about today, that device identity, um, the idea of least privilege. So by now I'm sure everybody is asking, wow, so great. How do I put it in the cart? How do I check out? How do I bring it home? Um, well, you can start by checking out our, uh, our docs page. So I, I write quite a bit of the docs and if they stink, tell me please, cause I'll try to make them better. Uh, but you can see up here, we have uh, the header where you can find the docs, API doc, uh, some blog posts. This articles is where you'll find, oh, it's totally illegible. Uh, this come up in a second, openzd.github.io. Um, but up here is where you'll find that bootstrapping uh, trust series. Number two here is you're getting started. Uh, the first one, I don't want to use Docker. I hate Docker. I don't want to use Docker ever, but I'd like bash because it's written, it expects bash. So if you have a Windows machine, you're going to need WSL like I run. Um, but you can you can host it all yourself and just start it right now. Like it literally, if, if I bet if you go out there and you click that button, and if you have bash, you'll have your overlay network before this presentation's over. Uh, if you love Docker, you can go out and run things in Docker. If you love Docker Compose, you can use Docker Compose. I have a relatively complex network out here that we could talk about too, that you could use and see what that's all about. Uh, and then you could, of course, host it yourself. If you want to just put it on some, you know, virtual private server idea out there, you can host it yourself and, and totally do that. All the SDKs that we have available, uh, I stack rank them in the order in which they get most love. This whole top row gets a lot of love. The bottom row doesn't get as much love, but hey, that's where C Sharp is. And we're a Java user group, so that's where it belongs on the top row. And of course, uh, you can always contribute back. Uh, it totally is open source. All of this is open source. All of it's free. You can go install all of it right now. Uh, you can click the button and uh, you know submit some doc changes if you don't like something and you want to do it yourself. 
here's all of our interesting socials. Um, I would ask that you go out and check out. We, we do a ZD TV every Friday. So out on YouTube, you'll have to search for open ZD because we don't have a great link to get to it. Um, but we also have a GitHub that you can go check out. Uh, Twitter is at OpenZT and OpenZiggy. You can see Ziggy's down here. He's got his test kitchen. He's got his little chef hat. Um, discourse group. So if you have any questions, we've got a couple of users out there who are pretty active. We'd love more. Uh, GitHub, I, I mentioned. Uh, you can email me, clint at openzd.org. Um, and yeah, that's it. And then uh, the one thing is if I could if I could bend your ear, we're trying to get this the word out to people. So if you could go to the openzd slash ZD project and give us a star, we've got 130. Oh, 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 oh it's 153, but technically it's 160 something right now. So if you guys could help us drive those stars up, it'll help us get the word out. Uh, that's really one of the big reasons I'm here tonight is because uh, I, I honestly and truly believe Zero Trust Application Embedded is the future. I, 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 can't, like, I can't see anything better than it right now. Uh, so um, I'm totally all in on it. Um, and I should have removed this from my slide deck. And that's my slides. So I'll pause Question there. Time. Pardon me, Jean? Question time? Yeah, I'll pause there for questions. We've got a bunch of questions. Most of them are general, which is why I didn't interrupt you. The first one is, does OpenZD support WebSocket HTTP2 or HTTP3? Oh, I don't know about HTTP3. I don't know if Eugene, if you could come on and talk about that, but I'm pretty sure it supports all of those. Uh, we are simply a pipe. So the, the job of OpenZD is to establish a synthetic connection for you, which you can shovel bytes over however you want to shovel those bytes. And so I'm pretty sure we support all of that. I don't think there's anything standing in the way, but Eugene can correct me if I'm wrong. I got this fellow Eugene on who's uh, part of the team. He's, he's a big developer in the C Sharp SDK, our C SDKs and on the, thing, on the same team. Uh, yes, we, uh, this is uh, Eugene Kobikov. I'm a, uh, one of the engineers uh, on the project. We, so, yes. we don't, we don't, uh, we are protocol independent. Right. So. Uh, our network connections are just that. Yep. However, so, you want it, whatever bytes uh, the protocol will send, we'll, we'll just uh, deliver them to the other side. Yep. That's what I thought. So, whatever you want to shovel, we'll shovel them for you. We'll get them there securely and as fast as we can over that, uh, that fabric that I was talking about, the mesh. All right. Sorry about the fire engine. Remember, this is the New York City group. I'm in New York City. Um, is a session hijack unlikely when using this tool? So that's an interesting question because uh, a session hijack will be when somebody goes in, finds your session somehow, and then allows that session to be sent to a target. The, the magic of that is sending to the target. So if you're on the machine, which is supporting that session. So let's say it's a browser. Okay, I'll take a browser, for example. Um, I go to google.com, I get a session. I don't know if Google gives me a session, but let's say it does. You steal my session and you bring it to your computer and you try to go to my zero trust solution that requires that session. You can't, totally, utterly impossible. You will not have a strong identity. You'll have no notion, no idea how to get it there. Now, if you were on my machine, and you enter my browser <laughs> with you know, presumably not me watching, uh, then yeah, it would work then because my machine would be configured in a way to get that traffic there. But you have to be on my machine and then to compound problems, if it's uh, inside of an application that is um, app embedded, then probably not because you'll have to fire up a new instance of that application and stuff that session into that application somehow, which would be really hard. So almost certainly it would prevent that. And if I've gone to your machine, I've already won. Probably. There's a lot of, tr <laughs> lot of truth to that. Um, this is a question from before that you'd suggest to be table for later. How to proceed for improving the security of a domestic or office network, how to monitor in-out traffic? Yeah, and there's so a follow-up question about if you don't listen to ports, what tools would monitor set apps? Oh, well, that's a great, yeah, you are reliant on the OpenZD network and the metrics that it provides. So uh, OpenZD, totally free, totally open source, it provides a preponderance of metrics, which you can then go decide to chew through and figure out and look at. That's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, we do have a free tier. So NetFoundry, I work for NetFoundry. We have a free tier, 10, 10 devices. 
that you will get that sort of stuff from the enterprise. Like, you know, we're a software as a service or network as a service play, right? So you can get that from the, the fancy dashboards. You'll get that monitoring all from the enterprise version because like you need a whole data lake for that. And that's a lot, it's a lot, there's a lot behind there. How would you secure a regular network that's ready right now that you would use those tunneling applications I talked about. And it's not, like I said, it's not just for my, um, my, my desktop. Like I have a ZD desktop edge running on my phone right here. You know, I, I turn this thing on and suddenly I can chat to Eugene. So um, the test I like to use is could my mother use it? Now, it, as, a, uh, as a coworker, I might say, could my sales guy use it? Because that's usually a better, that's like the same test, right? Maybe sales guy's probably a little bit more talented at this than my mother is for sure. Um, and everybody at NetFoundry has these tunneling apps. Everybody understands what they are from customer support to QA, to sales, to the CEO, no problem. Using those tunneling apps, absolutely. Um, somebody will have to set up the server side that provides you that ingress into your, say, VPC or into your data center, right? Like get rid of your VPN entirely. You don't need a VPN at all. You just replace it with OpenCD. Um, and th that would have to be somebody like a DevOps dude or a programmer lady or, you know, whatever, some, somebody more technical, but totally, totally approachable from normal people. Speaking of the sales guy, what if you needed to convince a non-technical manager to use OpenCD? What would you tell them? Well, the, I mean, honestly, log for shell, uh, spring for shell right there are two great things to just say, hey, you know, what if we had a blast radius that wasn't this big, <laughs> it was this big, right? Because you still are attackable, right? So I'm not saying this is some sort of magic bullet, but the, the amount like, where, where OpenCD really shines are not for public, like if you have to have something public that anybody is supposed to be able to get to, zero trust isn't for you, right? But if you have a line of business adapter, or if you have a application that like, let's take Facebook. I was thinking about this earlier. Facebook is a great example. Facebook has a public face, but then once you are enrolled, authenticated, all that traffic could be absolutely shuttled over to your zero trust connection. So that's a great example of an app that you want to build. Um, you know, so we, like a gaming app, right? Like lots of people are into digital gaming. Oh, what was the thing that happened in New York City recently? The, the Caesars sports book, right? Caesars sports book. They, they could totally use OpenZD. Okay, cool. A little earlier, you mentioned the unique ID. Where is the unique ID stored? So it's not just a unique ID, it's as many as you possibly need. And this is actually a very, very big question. Um, my tunneling app itself, I think I have five identities in it right now. So the tunneling apps are all built for N identities. That means N networks generally, depending on each version of the operating system, like Linux will store it, I believe, as a file. So you are required to have good file permission hygiene. Windows stores it inside the Windows system profile, which is relatively protected. Uh, Mac will store it on the keychain. Android will store it on the keychain. Um, iOS will store it in the keychain. But um, generally speaking, you can also take it down to the hardware root of trust. So if you have a YubiKey or any kind of TPM or something like that, you could also take that private key and rely on a piece of hardware to provide the key because it's really not the file it's not the identity it's that key that really matters the identity just describes how do you access that key so if you have a hardware root of trust you could have a yubi key and require yubi key access too okay i have two more questions queued up before i ask them two announcements if you're listening and you have more questions make sure to get them into the youtube chat before clint finishes answering the second question and the other is we're running a contest on twitter if you retweet or at us on Twitter before we draw the winners, which will be after the questions and you will be eligible to win a prize. All right, that was our commercial. Our next question is, can you briefly describe the business model of a commercial company that has an open source product? Oh, sure, yeah, uh, there's lots of them. Um, the best thing I would tell you to do is go and Google open core because that is the idea behind a business which sells the software, which is open source. Uh, lots of them, like if you've heard of the thing called Kafka, there's another one called Confluent, which sells it. Red Hat has been doing this forever, but Red Hat maybe sells more support than anything else. But the whole basic idea is uh, some, of, some, some businesses 
will do the shyster, right? They'll they'll give you this this little teeny version for free, and then the big ones over here. That's what the one you got to pay for, right? Uh, OpenZD is not like that. OpenZD is all of the code is totally free and open source. Now we reserve the right to do fun things on your behalf, which make that a little bit easier. Like if you pay for the the big product, well even or even the freemium product, you get that data lake I talked about. You get those nice little dashboards. You get a whole UI that does a little bit extra stuff for you. It can deploy one of those edge routers for you into an Amazon data center, into a Google data center, into an uh, Oracle. You get a lot of like features like that. For you know me as a developer, when I do my stuff, I don't I don't ever use it. I just stand up the quick start. And I use the quick start. In fact, we'll see, I'm going to use the Docker one at the end of this where I'm, I'm running a, a, a big thing for me is I don't want to pay anybody anything. Five bucks a month is even too much, right? I want to do it on Docker on my host network if I could do it on my host network or on my, my laptop. So um, the example I'll show is all based around Docker. Sorry, I was on mute for the fire engine. Our next question is how to implement an IT watch strategy, especially against external attacks such as ransomware. Was that an uh, IT West strategy? What kind of strategy? An IT strategy against ransomware. Oh, so, well, this is the, you know, maybe the best part about an open ZD network. If you have some software, which you don't want people to be able to access without you knowing who they are, then you give them a strong identity. And when you give them a strong identity, you know who they are. By doing that, you have hidden your entire attackable surface from everybody who is not somebody that you have given that identity to. So some, some person in China can't just attack your machine because they, they, they literally can't get at your application. So ransomware generally has this thing they call land and expand, right? They get in and then they expand out. They do that horizontal movement. That's so important. And that's why the first level of zero trust I only have here because your whole network is available to you if you get on one side or the other, if they can be horizontally available. Ransomware is generally like that. So uh, like the Lapsus guys, I think, did it exactly like that. They had, they got one, um, they, they, they entered one machine and then just, just kept moving to the next one, to the next one, to the next one until they found some data they wanted to encrypt. They encrypted it. And now they say, hey, send me some money. So if you can't, if you can't horizontally expand, you have crippled ransomware. Did you say you were going to do a demo? Yeah, I got plenty of plenty of stuff to show. If awesome. In that case, good news. You have more time to enter the Twitter contest. Hey. Don't be doing a demo. Take don't it away. Please, don't, don't forget to follow Open Ziggy and Open ZD. Go give me that star. All right. So let me share my screen. Do, 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 do. Share the screen over here. All right. Let's see. Let's see if my demos will work. Let's see if they are going to be friendly. I got to find the right one first. Okay. So. This is my first demo. This is, uh, we used, we actually, we actually zetified Spring Boot before the whole Spring Shell came about, uh, just because it's so dang easy to do, right? Um, so here I have an application. It is the simplest of applications. It just stands up a listener and then serves three, uh, three paths, slash, slash, hello, and add. And I think it's even running. Yeah, it's even running. So if I go over to my browser here, uh, oh, by the way, I was going to mention this. I forgot to mention this. If you didn't see, one of our posts got the number two on Reddit R programming. And I learned some really valuable lessons about zero trust and how much people hate the term zero trust. So hopefully one of the people on this call was the one of the ones that flamed us because I, I think that would be great. I got downvoted a lot for the whole zero trust thing. But uh, if you haven't checked it out, go check that out too, because it's a, it's a pretty good blog post that we put out here about hosting a dark service with Spring Boot and OpenZD. It's basically almost the same thing I'm going to show you right here. Um, so here we got a simple annotation that just activates Spring. I've got a main function and I've got uh, a run. I've got that controller over here. Oh yeah, I was bringing up my browser so I can go to localhost, host colon 8080. And it says, greetings from Spring Boot. That's pretty awesome. I'm gonna show you now, all right, everybody settled. It's gonna take a while. So I'm gonna show you how we zetify this. All right, done. Okay, so what I did is I added a Tomcat customizer, boop, boop, annotation over here uh, to the scan base package classes, Tomcat customizer, and then your application itself. And then I've stopped my, my runtime. So I'm gonna run it back again. 
and it'll do its little compilation thing. And one of the one of the messages I'm looking for in here is, hey, I contacted the controller, and here's my edge router. And you can see um, where it is here, right there, 100. There's my edge router. I don't, I don't know what. Oh, this actually, this is running out of our uh, NetFoundry console. I, uh, this is not the uh, Docker base demo, but. Now, if I come back to my browser and I refresh it, you'll see that that thing is just going to sit here and it's just going to spin. And the reason why it's spinning is because this server no longer listens on port 8080. Like if you scan through here, it says it's initialized at port 8080, but then uh, ZD takes over and that actually doesn't happen. It doesn't actually it doesn't actually do the listening. So if I come back and I'm going to show you my desktop edge for Windows which has an identity that has a service. That service name is called Spring Boot Service. And it has exposed a URL called HTTP. I hit the escape key, but mistake. HTTP.ZD. Again, .ZD is not a valid top-level domain. Now, if I come over here and I go to HTTP.ZD, you'll see greetings from Spring Boot. So what's happened here is my browser tried to address http.zd, a DNS request was sent, it landed at my tunneling application that's running. I told it, here's a local IP address I want you to send that traffic to. The browser sent the traffic to that IP address. The tunneler intercept that IP address, sent it to a router in the sky, which then noticed that I want to send it back down to my server that's running here and sent it back down to my server running here and served greetings from Spring Boot. So if we want to like, you know, maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a dirty liar, right? I can come over here. I can put a breakpoint on this guy, put a breakpoint on this guy, come back and hit this again. And you'll see it hits my, it actually does hit my breakpoint. And this is going out to Amazon and coming back again, mind you. So, uh, you know, you can, you can get a, a feel for how you won't really feel the, the latency that's involved in this. I mean, unless you're going across the world, right? Like it's within reason. So that's demo one. That's showing how you would have a, a Spring Boot enabled server and a ZD Tunneler enabled client. So you could take, deploy the tunnelers all on your little uh, edge points, all, you know, all on the users that you have, add change one annotation, and suddenly you can have a zero trust server with a zero trust client and greatly improve your security posture just, just in that amount of time. Now, of course, you got to set up the network. You got to get a poke it the right way. Right? So there's work afterwards. And my demo is obviously glossing over some of that, but it's really not a lot of work. So the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to leave this Zetified server running. I'm going to just take it off screen so I don't get confused because, oh, I might take off my breakpoints. Let me do that. Because this is an application. This is a little bit more complicated, but we'll look at all of this code. There is a whopping 82 lines of code and it is Java after all. So there's a whole bunch of imports that don't really count, uh, but we'll just take it line by line. It's another Spring Boot application. And since I'm running another one over here, usually if I tried to start two at the same time, I didn't have enough time to figure out why Spring wants to start a listener when I'm just trying to run a client app, but it wants to start a listener on port 8080. But it'll, this will start a listener on port 8080, but I don't care about this one. I just didn't have enough time to figure out how to turn that off. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, we'll bootstrap an identity. Now I've already done that. I've already downloaded it. I've already enrolled it. So I have this identity ready to go. And you see, again, I'm going to, I'm going to go to that same URL that we just talked about HTTP.ZD. But in this case, I'm going to use a, uh, a this is going to be just a, a straight up Java app. Just, you know, it's just emulating, making a rest request is basically all it is here. But um, in this case, we're also doing some interesting things where we are initializing the um, the trust store, which we're going to, or the, the, the factory that we're going to feed to the client, because uh, what we'll, what is the important bit here is this line right here. It's called the SSL socket factory. Not every Java client is written with the same sort of um, ideas as OKHTTP OK is here. So this is allowing me to say, hey, client, I want you to use this SSL factory, which is where ZD gets, this is where all the little magic ZD bits get to come in, right? And then there's the, a little bit more magic right here, which lets me access the resolver. So when I create a request builder and when I make a request, 
it'll actually end up getting back into here and it will resolve that http.zd all on my behalf. And then I'll just print it all out and we'll see it all work. So I'll go ahead and debug it. And it should start up. This is also doing the same thing where it's actually going out to that edge router. You can see where's the, oh, there, it already got me the, the response greetings from Spring Boot right here. You can see it went to the URL of http.zd, which I challenge you to go find that top level domain. It does not exist. You will never find it. And now I've made a secure uh, request from my code running here in my local machine that goes up into the cloud in that router, then back down again into that. I got three screens, right? One's right here, one's right here, one's right there. Into that machine over there, which is, well, it's the same machine, uh, which is running my uh, debug session of the, the server. And I'm going to, now I'm going to take this and make it smaller again. So you can just, if you wanted to take a look. Oh, uh, yeah, you, you don't have to like screen cap. <laughs> don't, don't screen cap this. We have all this out on. If you go to github.com slash open ZD slash uh, SD, no, ZD SDK JVM. So out here, there is a samples project. I'll make it bigger for you samples project and it's sample okay http sample okay ecobi that's that eugene guy you heard earlier uh and then this sleep is not necessary I actually we fixed this little sleep so if you see what i did up here i ooh, it's a different that's a different one where's the git service oh it's right here uh so i checked to make sure the service actually exists and if i don't if my identity didn't have access to that service it would throw an exception right here. In fact, I could just give it a, a name that doesn't exist, reboot, rerun my application, and it will it'll blow up right here, throw an exception telling me the service isn't found. Do, do, do. Oh, it's gonna wait five seconds and then blow up because I told it it could wait five seconds. Uh, so this is a nice way because this, this is actually smart enough to wait the proper amount of time before the context is initialized, but you can get that code out there and check it out yourself. And that's a, uh, truly zero trust client to a truly zero trust server, no ports listening everywhere, all over an open ZD network. And that's, I gotta say, I think that's pretty neat. All right, so that's uh, demo number one. And demo number two is more terminal based. Bring this guy up. Um, so this one on the far left, this is where I'm running my Docker compose container. And it has a whole bunch of, uh, uh, actually, maybe I'll come over here, I'll do a Docker PS, if make that bigger. Well, that's not gonna make it bigger, make it bigger over here. Yep, come on, get, get away. All right, make it bigger now. Uh, so you can see I've got a whole bunch of Docker things running in there right now. The most important Docker thing that's running in there, Postgres right here. And now you can, those among you who are good with Docker are gonna say, ah, he's a cheater. He is exposed port 1542, 432, and sending it to 5432. I bet you that's how all this magic is going to work, but it's, it really isn't. So let me just, oh, I got my cheat seat over here, so I don't have to make you watch me hit up arrow a whole bunch of times. Where is it? Maybe up arrow would have been better because I'm not finding what I'm looking for. Here it is. Okay. Uh, so I can actually run a, run a, come on, you can do it. I can run a PSQL statement that attaches to localhost on port 155432. Give it my username and I'm gonna give it my password, postgres. I probably spelled that wrong. P-O-S-T-G-R-E-S, -E there you go. And now you can see I'm in this simple database and I can do a select star from simple table and I can get some rows back, okay? So that's pretty cool, but that's, that's all using, that's all, you know, that's not very fancy. That's just using an exposed port. But what happens, in fact, you might have caught it over here. If you watch this far left, you'll see some data fly by. Here, I'm going to use a Zetified Postgres. So again, Zetified, not a top level domain, but I can go to postgres.zetified, postgres, select star from a simple table and get my results back. So. All this is cool, this is great, but I'm uh, using this all local host, right? So it's all Docker, maybe not so magical, but it is pretty magical because, because, because I have a data grip. Let's go back and give them a plug one more time, data grip. 
Uh, and here you can see I have a data source that I've, this is, I can't like, they don't let me zoom in. So I hope you can read that, it's really small. Um, but you can see this is a data source. I have that simple database that we talked about just moments ago. And I don't know how to open up the table. Where's the open the table? I don't remember how to open the table. Uh, Google DDL. No, select star from simple DB. Boom. Come on. Oh, you're in the wrong database. Why doesn't it open my table? I actually can't. I don't know how to open the table up. I don't, I don't ever do this. <laughs> well, you can see it already notices the simple database. Like it, it found my, oh, simple table. That's why. Does control enter run it? Where's the run button? Where's the run compare? Anybody, anybody know how to use data grip? Execute. That's not execute right there. Execute. New session. Sure. Oh, there's my data. All right. Whew, I did it. I did it. Uh, now, Ooh. what's really cool, though, because I said all this is local, but you, you might have spotted this one right here, right? So I, I also set up a database in the cloud. So this database here is sitting and running inside of Postgres, uh, SSH to CD to AWS and do a P, actually maybe it's on my P SQL local Postgres, Postgres. So this is also the same database I set up that's out here running in the cloud and I can go back to data grip. And this is where, I, I mean, as a guy who used to have to VPN to support the production database, like this is where I would have loved this 20 years ago because I can open the Postgres, um, the, the Amazon Postgres one, and do the exact same thing I just did there. Where is my, I just don't know how to use uh, data grip really well. <laughs> really well. How do I make a new one? Export data, no, database tools, modify command. Anybody, find usages. I can't believe I should have, like every time I double click this, uh, you know what, maybe I just double click all the way into it. There it goes. It's like every time I've double clicked this before, it just pops up. So now that is the exact same thing that happened, but this time it happens out in Amazon land. And you can see that incoming connection that it just made. So that is zero trust database access from my home here in Rochester, New York to wherever that Ohio virtual public server, private server is through port, no port because I've dialed it through ZD. Um, I've told it what port it is here, but it's it's not relevant. Um, it has totally zero trust database. That is really my, cool. We have a couple of questions about this demo. Yeah. Um, so there's no port because it's going through ZD, but there's still connectivity so that you can get to it from the internet. Sure. What prevents someone from like brute, brute forcing the real port and finding out where it is? Oh, good luck. Yeah, the best, the best answer to that are twofold. First, in order to access the network, remember that you have to have that strong identity. So without that strong identity, you can't even get onto the network to begin with. Now, that doesn't mean that there is nothing, on, you know, nothing is attackable. Uh, what it means, I'm gonna bring this up again. That is the wrong slide. Why are you gonna do me like that PowerPoint? Let me turn this on, turn it back on again. All right, we're just gonna do it the hardcore way. We're gonna go over here and do it. Uh, these edge routers here, those things listen on the open internet. They are out there and they have to be listening. We generally configure them on port 443, which means there's a port that when this, this little arrow is right here from this ZD here and this ZD here outbound, that that is to 443 and it is absolutely listening right here. But that is just the synthetic entry point of the overlay network. You can't brute force, the you, you would have to understand the ZD overlay, um, because there's a little wrapper that goes around your bytes that basically tells you where this traffic can go. But then you'll have to get a certificate that allows you to actually you know, get onto the network itself. You'll have to have an identity that's the right identity. You can't just be on the network. You have to be able to dial the right, the, the right um, service. And then you have to be able to know how to engineer all that and, and spoof it. Now, if you get onto my machine, if you find my identity, you can absolutely write a program that will go and all do that for sure. You could totally do that. If you had a hardware root of trust, good luck. Because usually like a YubiKey, you got to touch them to activate them before you can really use it. And so if you had a feature like that, then you're good to go. Another thing I didn't even mention 
if you're using one of these tunneling devices, I'm going to turn off my tunneling device right now. And I'll turn it back on again because one of the things you get out of the box with this solution, well, that's, that's a bad look, isn't it? I don't know what that crash was. I'll blame Eugene. Let me turn this back on again. But when I turn it back on, um, one of the things that you get out of the box is multi-factor authentication. So this thing's going out and it's finding all of its identities. And you can see right here, I have to provide my digits before I'm allowed to connect to this network. So not only do I need a strong identity, I also need to multi-factor authenticate that strong identity. And then if I had a hardware root of trust, I mean, just, just imagine how difficult it is to brute force that. So basically it would have to be you. <laughs> basically, yeah. In fact, I, I, I already argue that the certificate that is part of an OpenZD network is already a second factor of authentication because, okay, sure, you can attack my, you got my certificate and you can send payload. Do you have the username and the password that you need to actually send that data and actually begin that attack? Like you have to get that afterwards. So the, the, the amount of hoops that you have to jump through to, to do a successful attack is really substantial. Okay, we are caught up on questions. Great. Well, that's my demo, that's all of it. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Rodrigo and then we will very shortly be doing winners. Oh, sorry, Barry. 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 Yeah, you're Barry. 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 Okay, Rodrigo is busy with- What you. happens when we change things? Uh, you just can't do it. Uh, Clint, thank you so much. Um, th this is really fascinating. I, I don't know whether to end up feeling um, very, very happy that OpenZD exists or very nervous that it needs to exist. But anyway, I'm really right. thankful for this talk. I hope everybody's enjoyed it and I hope they all go out and try it if they haven't already done so. Um, uh, uh, my my, my uh, best to Rochester, New York. Jean, you're gonna talk about the raffle now, right? Yes, I am. I have made a list of everybody who engaged with us on social media during the session, and we are going to be picking four of you as winners. Um, the winners I'm going to announce here and on YouTube, and we're going to ask you to email us your actual email address so we can give you the information. Barry, can you post the email address to send it to in the chat? Will do. All right. Our first winner is Ivan. Congratulations, Ivan. Our second winner is Alex. Congratulations, Alex. Our third winner is Malcolm. Congratulations, Malcolm. And our final winner, well, typing is hard. The final winner is Bill. Congratulations, Bill. Congratulations to all four winners. Remember to email us to claim your prize. I will turn it back over to Barry for closing remarks. And check that um, chat, the YouTube chat for our email address. Please email us, grab the prize, use it as soon as you can, it's wonderful stuff. Um, our next meeting is a workshop. It'll be on Wednesday, April 27th. Speaker will be Andres Almore, and he'll be speaking about J release. It promises to be a very good meeting. Please, please, please uh, visit our website, javasig.com. Follow us on Twitter, NYJavaSig. Uh, do all those things, help us out, become part of the community. Until next time, have a good evening.